As I was saying, thank you for coming. I know you, many of you have been here for many days, and uh, you've heard some many uh, great talks. Um, I've been here for, since the beginning of the Reinforcement Learning one, and it's been fantastic. So thanks, Joel and Doina and others who have organized this fantastic um, summer school. So I'm actually going to pick up in particular on Nando's talk. I didn't know what I was going to talk about until I heard Nando, and I said, OK, I know what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, and uh, I'm going to present a, a slightly different um, point of view or take take on a very similar similar uh, questions and and and, um, and I'm calling this sort of steps towards continual learning and I have two affiliations people have been uh, explaining their affiliations I'm a professor at the University of Michigan I'm also the chief scientist at a uh, startup I co-founded with Peter Stone and Mark Ring called um, uh, Kojitai and in fact Kojitai is a continual learning company the all the work I'm going to talk about has been done uh, at universities uh, so not, none of this is from uh, Kojitai uh, at the moment. Okay, so the words continual learning might mean something intuitively to many people. I just want to break it down into what precisely I mean by continual learning. And this will be uh, connect also to what uh, Nando talked about, but in slightly different ways of slicing it. So um, when I say continual learning, when you want to build continual learning agents, I mean agents that can learn new skills over time from experience as one of the first elements. Now, this might seem like well, what's so radical or, or, or sort of interesting about that? RL is about learning options or skills. But, but let's break it down a little bit more. Learning new skills over time means I have to store those skills somewhere. I have to retrieve them sensibly. And hardly any, and continually over time, right? And hardly any RL system or agent does that at the moment. So this is already just this ability is an interesting challenge to take seriously and, and, and work on it. Um, learn new knowledge over time. And by knowledge, I mean option conditional predictions, skill conditional predictions. Be able to make predictions about the world conditioned on behavior. And again, do this over time. We have RL work and other work that builds models, builds predictions. But again, do it over time and integrate that in such a way that we can reuse and incorporate these skills and knowledge that we've acquired over time to help learn more complex skills and knowledge. Right, this developmental, this incremental aspect of learning new skills and learning new knowledge and, and then reusing it over time is a really important challenge uh, that um, you know, people are working on. Uh, and you want to do it in a way that's scalable and without catastrophic forgetting and things of that sort that you heard about, uh, presumably, in the uh, deep learning um, part of the summer school as well. Another really important question, I, Nando touched on this one as well, is the idea of intrinsic motivation, right? If you have an agent that's going to be doing this kind of continual learning, then what should drive its behavior? What should an agent do in such a setting? Right? Reinforcement learning comes with a task. Continual learning doesn't come with a task, or not necessarily come with a task. So you can think of intrinsic motivation to drive experience in the absence, or perhaps more accurately, too long a delay in extrinsic, in extrinsic rewards or extrinsic drives or extrinsic motivation. So this is a fundamental question in continual learning as well. And by the way, again, to connect uh, to work you've heard about, one particularly salient source of intrinsic rewards are the humans, are humans, or other agents, experienced agents. Right? You heard about imitation, the drive to imitate, and so on, as, as particularly salient examples of where intrinsic motivation might come from. And finally, of course, the overall goal is still the, is still the RL goal, right? Which is to build in agents that can become increasingly competent over time, not just in terms of the amount of skill and knowledge they have, but also in term, terms of how well they do in accumulating the extrinsic reward when it is available. So this is the continual learning problem in, in one slide, right? This is a problem that I think uh, so, so, you know, one thing you could be asking is sort of, you know, how is this different from other things in AI and RL and so on? So it's a very RL-centered view of AI, right? It's a very RL-inspired, RL-based view of how to think about the overall AI question, as opposed to, you know, vision is an important problem, or speech is an important problem, or language is an important problem, which are, of course, they are extremely important problems. But that's a different way of slicing up the AI problem, and this is a, um, this is a continual learning way of slicing up 
the, the, the error problem. So I want to make sure that at least what this, this, this uh, framework is about, this, this setting is about, is reasonably clear. Any questions about this, particularly how it relates to RL? I mean, I think this certainly is coming from RL. The one, one difference or a difference in emphasis is an emphasis on knowledge, right? Not just on behavior. Of course, knowledge for good behavior and the intrinsic motivation. So it certainly comes from RL, but emphasizes these things. Any questions about this? By the way, I noticed when I was sitting in the audience that sometimes people have questions, they just raise their hand, but it's hard to see that you raised your hand. So if you have a question, just blurt something out so that I can, I can hear it and then, um, and then uh, know that you want to ask a question. Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll harken back to something Nanda talked about. You know, kids in toys, uh, as, an, as, a, as a, you know, you leave a kid in a room with things without an extrinsic task. I'll come back in half an hour. What will they do? They'll come to understand the world they're in by playing around in that world, by uh, intrinsic drives to explore, to to destroy, to, to build, to climb on things, to kick things, to do, depending on the child, do all kinds of uh, different things. Um, and they build a fundamental understanding of the world in that way. So to the extent that you want to build truly robust AIs, right, as opposed to AIs to solve very well-defined specific problems, not that that's a undesirable or, or easy thing to do either, but to the extent that you want to build artificial intelligences that are able to um, really robustly understand the world and behave in it. To that extent, we can't build in knowledge. To that extent, knowledge has to be driven by, has to be learned from experience and be intrinsically motivated in the, in the sense of uh, being driven to learning useful things. So that's the, that's the setting that this, this comes from. Yes? Yeah, so option conditional predictions are just behavior conditional predictions. What will I see? Or uh, will there be a door when I walk out of the left corridor here? How far will the door be? Um, how much time will it be before I see the sunlight if I walk by a certain path? Um, if I pick up a phone and call my wife, is she going to be able to, is she likely to respond? What's the probability that she'll respond? These are option conditional predictions. The option is the behavior I'm doing, and predictions are certain features of the future that I want to predict. What sounds a bit like planning, is that? Related? Yes, very interesting question is how does all this relate to planning? So how do you use predictions to plan? How do you use knowledge to plan uh, is a really interesting question. I'm about to show you a really simple example from my work um, more than a decade ago, 2004. A child's playroom. Uh, this is a, a paper at NIPS. Um, so let me just, this is in, in my judgment, sort of what, and now, by now, you know, for you young people and ancient, maybe many of you weren't even born. No, I'm sure. Uh, uh, ancient example of a continued learning demonstration. So this is, a, this is a, a toy world, a child's playroom, which has objects in it, um, objects that have things like there are bells, there is a, a, monk, a toy monkey. A hand, so you can imagine that there is a, the, uh, the agent is looking at the, uh, this from, from the top, where we're we getting a bird's eye view, uh, but the agent has an eye, a focus, uh, and the agent sees what's, where the eye is. The agent has a hand, the agent can sense what's under the hand, and the agent has this marker, this thing with a crosshair is called a marker, and uh, it's like an indexical representation, it can remember where it was. And then there are these buttons, the blue button to turn music on, the red button to turn music off. It can push something into the ball and roll the ball. It can hit the ball and roll the ball. If it rolls the ball into the bell, the bell rings. There's a light switch which turns the light on and off. If the light's off, you can't see the colors, things of that sort, right? So the, the agent is put in this world without any extrinsic task, perhaps, and has to learn to, to achieve mastery over this little, really trivial, uh, contrived toy world. And so I've already described some of the primitive actions. The hand and the eye can be moved. I think the eye can be moved north, south, east, west. The eye can be moved to the marker. The marker can move to the eye. The hand can be moved to the eye, things of that sort. Okay. 
Um, and I already described some of the things one can do in the room. And, 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 and I, can, I think the, um, what you want the system to be able to do is somehow learn all the things it can do in this world. How to turn the music on, how to ring the bell, how to kick the ball, how to, uh, how to make the, uh, the, 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 the toy monkey cry out, which was, I don't know why I use that phrase when writing this paper, but uh, it's been uh, called a monkey world since, since uh, we built this, built this little domain. Um, but, to, but, but the ultimate, the hardest skill to learn is to make the toy cry out, which requires having the lights off and the music playing and the bell ringing. It's a loud noise and the lights off makes the monkey cry out. Okay, so that's the setting. I, I don't know if anybody talked about options. I know many of you know enough about options. Options are basically temporally extended behaviors. And there's a nice, very nice mathematical formalism. And Doina, who's here uh, at McGill, was one of the leaders in developing this um, option sort of work. OK, I won't talk much about that. So now let me bring in the continual learning elements and t tell you how we sort of solve this very simple problem in this sort of continual learning way. So what is the intrinsic reward here? The intrinsic reward was, error, was proportional to error in prediction of a salient events. A salient event were light turning on and off, sounds turning on and off, music turning on and off, things that happened. They were salient events. And, this, and the agent was going to learn options driven by this intrinsic reward to achieve those salient events. It was also going to learn to predict those salient events. And if there's an error in that prediction, that was intrinsically rewarding. Okay, So every time you experience a new salient event, you allocate a data structure to build an option for that salient event. Build an option meaning build a model, build a prediction model, and build a behavior model, build a policy. Okay, And so you're, every time you experience a new salient event, you're, you're allocating sort of a, a skill for it and a knowledge for it. Okay, and, and we were using this really simple idea, which is also something Nando talked about, which is all these options that we have initiated were being learned all the time in parallel from all the behavior that was being generated. And things are called intra-option learning methods, and we use those uh, to, to do these sort of things. And then, because we had these options that predicted what will happen when the option finished, we could do planning to connect back to planning. We could do planning with those option models to try to make value function updates to our behavior. So here's the picture I want to paint for you. There's a behavior policy that's being learned with the intrinsic reward. There are option and option models that are being learned driven by salient events. The behavior policy's reward is error in prediction of a salient event. So whenever it encounters a salient event it didn't predict, it feels rewarded. Okay? And the Q function, the, the Q value function for the behavior policy is being used in a Dyna, it'll be learned in a Dyna like way. You're learning from the steps in the world and you're learning from your option models that you're, you're predicting. So I don't know if anybody's talked about Dyna, but it's a simple idea of mixing model free and model based, model based reinforcement learning. Okay, so here's a visualization of what happens. So the x axis is time, and these different sort of um, uh, graphs are for different salient events. L on means light on, L off means light off, S on means sound on, uh, music on, music off, things of that sort. Every tick is the occurrence of a salient event. The height of the vertical bar is the intrinsic reward obtained when that salient event happens. So if the height is, very, is, is, is tiny, is this kind of height, then that means there was no intrinsic reward. So what you see is, very early on, intrinsically, turning light on and off is a very simple skill. You just have to hit the light switch. So lots of lights on and off are happening, and it's getting surprised by them, because it's, every new state is different. So it gets surprised in this state. You know, when the ball is in a different place, a different state, the, the, the buttons are in a different place, different state, so it gets surprised and it learns that, then at some point, once it knows how to turn the lights on and off, it gets bored by that and, and tries to learn and gets, gets to learn how to kick the ball into the bell to ring the bell. And that's sound on. And then music on, right? Now, of course, once it turns the music on, then if it's able to also turn the light on, that was a different state. So it gets surprised again, right? So that's why the light on off intrinsic rewards don't go to zero over time because it 
It, once it learns new skills, it can generate new states that it hasn't experienced before. Because now it can be in a state where the music is also on. Yes? Yeah, tall bars and short bars, the amount of error. So this means it got very surprised, and then it means it got. So the reward is proportional to the error in prediction. So the height of the bar is error in prediction. OK? The, this bar, this little bar, it means just salient event occurred, but there is no reward. So you can see a natural developmental progression. Easy things get learned first. They make it possible to learn harder things, right? Which, and then they make it possible to learn still harder things, and this progression happens over time. And, I'm, and so there's a hierarchy of reusable skills, right? To the, the primitive actions were things like uh, saccade to random object, saccade eye to random object, move marker to eye, eye to marker, move hand up and down, north, south, east, west. These are the primitive skills that were built in. And then it can turn the light on. It can learn to turn light off. Once it learns, turns light on, it can see the color of the light switches and turn music on. Once it can turn music on and turn the, bring the bell and turn the light off, it can then activate the toy. So this automatic hierarchy of things happen in a very simple, simple way. Okay? And, and you've seen graphs like this from Nando yesterday, which is a graph that basically says, look, learning all of these things in parallel ends up achieving much faster learning than only being only learning from intrinsic reward, where the intrinsic, sorry, extrinsic reward, where the extrinsic reward here was the hardest skill, which was to make the, uh, the monkey, activate the monkey, toy monkey. It starts clapping or crying or something like that. Okay, so you see this benefit that Nando was talking about in, in, in all the same ways, exactly the same ways, but now I've given you a very concrete, simple example of how to do this kind of Continue learning in this very simple domain. OK, so I want to wrap up this very simple example. I'm going to build on it a little bit more. So in this very simple example, we learn skills and options. We learn new knowledge in the form of predictions. We reuse those skills to learn. We reuse previously learned skills to learn more complex skills. And the agent got more competent over time at extrinsic reward. Now, there are lots of caveats. This, is, this, is pre, this predates all the deep learning excitement, right? So it's extremely contrived domain. Uh, the intrinsic motivations were hardwired, were about hardwired salient events, so very limited form of intrinsic reward. Everything was done on lookup tables, so there was no catastrophic forgetting issues. And it, was, you know, it didn't scale very well, you, know, you can imagine. So by the way, there were lots of people working on this sort of thing at that time, Schmidt Huber, uh, Kaplan, Odier. Uh, Thrun, Sebastian Thrun, and, and uh, I forget Moller's last first name, um, and many others. Yes? So what does it mean that at tables? How do you learn the uh, options? Like so this would literally look up table. We're learning a mapping. We're learning a policy in a lookup table. We're learning the initiation set in a lookup table. We're learning the termination set in a lookup table. We're learning a prediction model, option prediction model lookup tables. Everything was done in lookup tables because it's a tiny domain. We could do it. So there was no interference with options. There was no, no, need, no, no catastrophic forgetting. All the interesting issues that come up with neural nets weren't present in this early work. But I, but I think the pieces are all there, right? You're learning options. You're learning options in parallel. Early learning of options leads to situations where you can learn harder options. And because you're building these option conditional predictions, you can plan. You can do both model-based and model-free learning and piece it together to accelerate the learning of, of new tasks. Yes? Is this extent in neural nets by having different sub-policies uh, sub for skills, or does it uh, extend to neural nets by having a single neural network that learns these? Great question, right? I, uh, both of them will have advantages and disadvantages. So you can certainly go that route. Uh, these were certainly completely disjoint options, right? You could, you could imagine still doing that with neural nets, or you could imagine doing it in a, in a joint way, and then have to deal with interference, things of that sort. But you might get better generalization, faster learning. So you have, uh, there are pros and cons. There are trade-offs for these things, right? OK. So now I'm going to take an extended diversion to really focus in on this question of where do rewards come from. Because I've done some work on this that I think is um, uh, lays some basic foundations of this that uh, I want to I share with you 
sort of where do rewards come from and, and really focus on that specific question. This is joint work with a lot of people, including Andy Barto um, and Rick Lewis and my students, Nara Pong and Jonathan and Xiao Xiao. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna explain a very simple idea to you which I've used different words over time to describe it. I'm gonna call it here parameters, preferences, confound. So again, the starting point of reinforcement learning is somebody gives you a reward function. But in a continuous learning setting, it's not clear where the reward function comes from. But at least something is clear. The robot or the agent or the AI is, is acting on somebody's behalf. Well, it's not clear whether it's an individual human being or society, but let's ignore that question because that's a very interesting question in its own right. But imagine for now that there is this agent designer, the human being, that has preferences over the agent's behavior, right? The robot doesn't have preferences. The human designer, the agent designer, has preferences over robot behavior. And those preferences can be captured in the form of a reward function. Let's call that the objective reward function. So the question is, what should the agent's reward function be? Because we are building an RL agent. So it's going to use rewards to determine its behavior. So now there are two reward functions. The agent designer's reward function and the agent's reward function. And RL confounds those two, right? One notion of reward function, the objective reward, is a notion of preferences or evaluation. How good is the agent's behavior for the agent designer? The second notion of reward function is a guidance reward function. They're parameters to the agent behavior. If I take your favorite RL algorithm and I give it a reward function, it'll generate a behavior. If I change the reward function, it'll generate a different behavior or different distribution of behaviors. So there are two reward functions. There's an evaluation or preferences notion of reward function, which I call objective reward function, and then a subjective or an internal reward function that guides the agent's behavior. And in standard RL, this is confounded. But they don't have to be, right? And so, and so we have, uh, so, so by the way, this, uh, you've seen this picture before, I imagine. This is the, this is the uh, standard view of RL in which the rewards come from the environment, this is a more sensible view of an organism, and maybe we should build our artificial agents this way, in which the reward comes from a critic inside the, inside the agent. Okay, so I think you've seen this view, so I won't, I won't spend much time on it. Okay, there are lots of approaches to designing reward. Question. Yes. Uh, yes. No, in this figure, I'm only showing the internal reward function because I'm not showing the human designer in this figure at all. Okay. This is just the agent, the artificial agent. Can you show the, well, did you reference the publication for this? Yes, this, actually this, is this in Sutton and Barto book now? I'm not sure. I, uh, there is a, there is a um, I have a paper called Where Do Rewards Come From? If you look for that, you'll find it. But, um, I don't think it's new to that paper. Um, so inverse reinforcement learning is a very interesting idea. I'll come back to that I, uh, in, in the next part of this. Reward shaping, lots of people have worked on that. Preference elicitation, mechanism design, lots of approaches to designing rewards. So here is the formal thing I want to communicate to you, and I won't spend terribly much time on it. It's called the optimal reward problem. So the optimal reward problem takes this confound seriously. There are now two reward functions. The thing that's given is the objective reward function or the agent designer's reward function, R sub O. You don't get to muck around with that because that's the agent designer's reward function. And then you have a internal reward function, R sub I, which is the agent's reward function, right? And you give that, and, you, and the agent is G, and it's parameterized by this R sub I. And you can give it whatever you want, and here are all the other parameters of the agent. So maybe it's doing Q learning with a neural net and all, with certain learning rate, all the other parameters are in theta. R sub i is the reward parameterization. And you put it in some environment, EN, N, environment ENV, and it produces an interaction, a trajectory H, from that environment and this agent. The utility of this trajectory H, or history H, to the agent is U sub i of H, which sums the intrinsic reward. The utility of that same trajectory to the objective agent, which is the human, 
is, of course, some of the objective rewards. So the optimal reward problem is to define the reward function, ri star, so that if you give it to the agent, it generates a trajectory that optimizes the human designer's objective utility. So this is the optimal rewards problem. Right? I've now set up a mathem mathematical problem that in some sense explains where reward should come from. And we have written a paper and I'm, um, in which you know, we look consider natural agents. You know, where would, so who's the agent designer in, 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 in natural agents? Evolution. Evolutionary objective reward function is passing on of genes, right? Procreation. But evolution has reached inside our brain and designed an internal reward function had designed an internal reward function that makes us very successful, given our particular, the rest of our agent architecture. So the, 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 the difficult challenge in solving the optimal reward problem is that a choice of optimal reward is a fundamentally a function of the agent and its bounds and its capabilities. Different agents you would give a different reward function to, depending on what their, the rest of the agent architecture is. Is crucially a function of the rest of the parameters theta of the agent. Okay, so I've set up a mathematical problem. How do you solve this problem? Uh, but if you could solve this problem, it would derive the best reward function for you. So the thing is, you want to define, to really do AI, to really build a continual learning agent, what you'll have to do is somehow Define a reward function at just the right level. If it's too sparse and too infrequent, much more like the objective reward, then the agent will not succeed in its, in the, in its lifelong learning experience. If, on the other hand, you can make it too precise, too detailed, but then the agent will be inflexible. It won't be able to deal with a variation of environment it could find itself in. So somehow there's a right level of reward that allows the agent to be most successful over the distribution of environments it could find itself in. So it's ready to learn, you know? The reward that makes it ready to learn effectively in the distribution of environments it's in. So designing a good reward function may actually be an underexplored way of learning to learn. Anyway, sorry, just let's, uh, I'm trying to connect to Nando. Okay, um, can look at time. Let me give it, again, I, I'll give a toy example predating neural net days, or not, that's, that's inaccurate. Predating the deep learning craze, and then I'm gonna give you a deep learning example in a minute. Okay, so here's a toy world, a very, very simple world in which there's an agent shown by a circle, and all there is in the agent in the room are two things, a worm that the agent could eat, and get a small amount of measly reward, or it could pick up the worm and go to the fishing hole at the bottom and get fish and eat fish, which is nicely rewarding. Okay, the agent is gonna be a Q-learning agent. So what reward should you give the agent? The objective reward is the, um, the, the, the worm has a very tiny amount of positive reward, 0.04. But fish is a reward of one. So that's the objective reward. What reward should you give the agent though? Now if the agent is a lookup table Q learner with arbitrary large amounts of time to learn, it's clear. If the agent is unbounded, what you should do is clear. Give it the objective reward function. After all, it'll end up optimizing it. So we're gonna make the agent bounded to simulate the notion of real world agents, even though this is a toy problem, the agent can be unbounded is you're gonna bound it. What kind of bound are we gonna look at? We're gonna look at bounds of finite lifetimes. So the agent may have only a small amount of lifetime to learn. So now if you solve for the optimal reward problem, you get this kind of behavior in which the x-axis here is the lifetime of the agent. So each point is a different agent with different amount of lifetime. If the agent's lifetime is very short, the best reward turns out to be to slightly prefer, if the agent's lifetime is very short, it doesn't have time to learn to fish, because to fish, it has to go to the worm, find the worm, pick it up, 
not eat it, and keep carrying it, not eating it, to the fish and catch the fish and then eat the fish. That's a more complicated process to learn, right? So a very short lifetime, it, the red bar is the reward for, the, rewar for the, the internal reward for eating the worm, so to speak, and the blue one is for eating the fish, so to speak. So a very short lifetime, you have a slight preference over, you give a slight preference to the worm and you say fish, eh, you can't even get to the fish. You never pick up the fish. If you have a middling lifetime, then it learns to say eating fish is really bad because you don't want to be distracted by eating the fish. If you happen to eat fish, you'll get distracted by that and you will not even pick up, get enough food from the worm, reward from the worm. So it says eating worm is really good, eating fish is really bad. And now if you have, and you, then you cross a larger lifetime, and now it has enough time to have a sensible reward function, which is eating fish is really good, eating worms is really bad. Question. Yes, uh, hang on, let me, sorry, let me finish this train of thought, then I'll answer a question. So, so here's the, the, the performance curve you get again with lifetimes. With short enough lifetime, basically, with the intrinsic reward, it, it learns to eat the slight difference of about three up to this point. This is the point at which it can learn to fish with the intrinsic reward, the red curve. This is the point it would learn to fish with the extrinsic reward. So because of bounds and adapting reward, it can learn to fish earlier by adapting the internal intrinsic reward. So I've kept everything else fixed. It's the same Q-learning algorithm, same hyperparameters. I'm showing you the objective utility on the y-axis. I'm showing you the effect of tuning, if you like, the internal reward functions. It can learn to fish much faster Sorry, it can learn, sorry, that, I, I'm, that's an inaccurate statement. It can learn to fish more effectively if the, if the horizon, if the lifetime is shorter with intrinsic rewards than with the objective. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was gonna ask, like, what the agent knows, but I guess it's still learning and it doesn't know the environment. It's a lookup table, it, 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 um, it sees, it's, it, every state is, it's Markov. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, have a model of the environment. It doesn't have a model of the environment. I'm doing Q-learning in this one. Yeah, the two curves were preference, the internal reward, the magnitude of internal reward for um, eating the worm, if you like, the, that's the red one, and eating the fish, which is the blue one. So it's learning, if it's a short lifetime, it learns to have slight preference for the worm, but the crucial one is the middle lifetime, because in the short lifetime, it can't learn very much anyway. The short life, with a middle lifetime, it really says I shouldn't be distracted by the fish, so it gives it a large negative reward for eating the fish. The y-axis is magnitude, they're two different things. The x-axis is lifetime. X-axis is lifetime, the y-axis is the reward coefficient. So it's positive, high positive for the worm, the red one, and blue uh, is the coefficient for eating the fish. In the optimal reward function, exactly right. Thank you for helping clarify that. Yes, coefficients for the optimal. The reward function is a function of some features of state, and this is the coefficients for that. I'm just giving you a quick intuitive picture. Okay, I wanna, so now, um, let me skip this. So now let's uh, fast forward to the deep learning days, and, uh, and so we did in 2010, we came up with an algorithm for solving the optimal rewards problem. And, and the algorithm is a very straightforward idea. I won't even spend much time on it. Again, the, the perspective is very simple. There is an objective utility that we care about. We're gonna treat the internal reward function as a parameterization of a policy. The internal reward function given an RL agent will generate behavior in an environment. So if I change the reward function, I'm changing the behavior of the agent. So it is a parameterization of a policy. Non-stationary policy, but a policy nevertheless. Right? So I can do policy gradients with res I'm gonna do a gradient of the objective utility with respect to the internal reward parameters. 
So what I need to do is do a gradient procedure through the algorithm that the agent is going to use to convert the intrinsic rewards to behavior. As long as that process is differentiable, I can differentiate through it to adapt my internal reward parameters to climb the gradient with respect to the objective utility. Make sense? I have an objective utility. You've all seen policy gradient. Peter Abiel gave a great talk on policy gradients, right? Now I have, but, but with reward parameterizations that are typically thought of as neural net parameters. Here I'm thinking of, sorry, policy parameters that are, that are typically thought of as neural net parameters. Here I'm thinking of the policy parameters as the internal reward function which is going to be translated by some procedure into behavior. As long as that procedure is differentiable, I can do policy gradients to learn good reward functions. Yes? Uh, this is like the designer is messing up with the, with, is looking internally at the agent. So the designer let the agent go and then from time to time opening up, see at the very, oh yes. Yeah, I mean, except, except that it's a meta algorithm, right? It's like a policy gradient algorithm. It's a meta algorithm. It's the meta algorithm is inside the agent, outside the agent. It's really, it's computational. It's tweaking the, so what we literally did, and I don't want to show you, you've seen these things before. I'm just going to show you this picture and then show you some results. So what we did is we did um, UCT or look ahead search for planning in Atari games. So not learning, I'm doing planning, right? And so you see, it turns out look ahead search is a differentiable procedure. And you can very scalably differentiate through it. Just turns out what you do to do value backups, you can do gradient backups. So you can do gradient backups through a look ahead search or UCT. So what we did is basically we gave it, instead of having hardwired features for reward functions, we gave it the usual frames as inputs to a neural net whose output was the reward function to use with UCT. So let me say that again because of an unusual setting. We're going to give it images of the current situation. We're going to pass it through a neural net whose output is going to be the reward function to assign to the current situation, to any situation that you feed in. And that is going to be the reward function that UCT is going to use to do its planning. And we're going to backprop to the whole thing through UCT and through the neural net to learn the reward function. And, and it's straightforward, but what I wanted to show you was um, that we tried this in 25 Atari games, and we did the ratio of the performance with and without this intrinsic reward, and the ratio is more than one. One is, is the vertical line, and in most games, uh, it led to improved performance for UCT. But this was a little bit of cheating because we were giving extra, because UCT is compute hungry, and of course, to compute the intrinsic reward also takes computation. When we correct for that, uh, to, to have a more fair apples to apples comparison, things change a little bit, but still we get a win in most, in most cases. Here we balance computation, because you can do deeper UCT, wider UCT, for the time you would take to compute the reward function at every, every step. So to balance out the time, you still get a win. Yes? Yeah, sorry, Didn't, nobody's talked about UCT. Okay, UCT is basically look ahead search. So, uh, so one way to plan would be you're in a current situation. You take actions in the real world. You, sorry, you, you, you simulate actions and you simulate next states you could get to and you build out this tree. The, so look ahead search would be building out this tree and backing up values. But you can't do that because the branching factor is too large and you can't go very deep. So UCT is a clever way and Chaba is here, I saw him walk in. He's one of the inventors of the basic idea behind UCT. It's, it's, a, it's a, to use sort of banded bounds to, to help determine uh, which actions are worth exploring in this tree. So you can get a much more efficient look at search algorithm. Okay. All right. So that was a quick, uh, quick introduction to the notion of optimal rewards and how to use them in, uh, in any kind of agent in which, we, um, in which we would have differentiable procedures that map reward functions to behavior, right? Any, any, any procedure that maps rewards to behavior in a differentiable way, you could then use idea of policy gradients 
to derive re good reward functions uh, for, uh, by taking gradients with respect to the objective utility. OK, so now I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a theoretical piece of work that I'm actually quite excited about. Yes? So what's the dimension of your reward function? Right. Uh, in the, in the, in the, um, in the um, uh, Atari games work, the, the uh, input to the reward function was frames, right? So we gave the last four frames, and it outputs a scalar. It just tells you what is the reward associated with this situation. That's right. We're, we're, we have this neural net that takes observations, gives it a, a reward that is then used by the UCT procedure in conducting its look-ahead search. We're doing, poli we're, doing policy we're doing gradients with respect to the objective function, reward function we care about through UCT, through this neural net. So what's, the only thing that's being learned is the reward function because UCT is a fixed planning procedure. So what we are showing is that, that repeated planning can be improved by adapting the reward function. And the performance gain that I was showing you was after learning a good reward function. Uh, yes? Uh, when you did your evaluation on the, to get the actual results, right. do you, do you, are you still doing learning as you are generating the... the no. I think, if I remember correctly, it's been a few years now. We learned the reward function, and then we compared the performance, giving, giving uh, straight UCT more, enough computation to match the time it takes to take an action with the learned reward function so in a second. So my concern is that now you are learning both the, 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 the agent and the reward. So you have effectively like doubled the number of trainable parameters. So, so could, could the improvement just be because you have more trainable parameters and a more powerful reward? So in the UCT, there are no trainable parameters. UCT is a planning, planning algorithm, right? So I then use a learning procedure to gradients to learn a reward function, then that's fixed. So now again, there are no trainable parameters. Now I compare these two agents. I have trained the reward function one agent. The algorithms are the same. It's the same agent, the UCTs. One has a learned reward function. One uses the objective reward function. And I'm comparing the performance of these two, except to make it fair, the one that's using the objective reward function because it doesn't have to compute a reward function in an expensive way through a forward pass through a neural net, I give it more computation per, you know, I match the computation per time step. Yes? Is there a sense that the reward function that you learn should, does, should not be stationary? Yes. That, right, if you are, have a fixed Good. reward function that drives you to learn something, but by then you've learned it, so, or do you think that because you have these two levels of reward, that that handles that? No, you're completely right. All the work that we've done in optimizing rewards uh, in this way is all for planning. There's a good reason, right? Planning is a fixed procedure. To do this for Q-learning or a learning algorithm would be a much more interesting challenge because exactly, you're exactly right. In fact, I have a theorem I never wrote uh, in my head, which is it's pretty clear that the optimal reward should be a function of the entire history. It can't be, even if the underlying observation is Markov, the optimal reward will have to be a function of history. It will have to be non-Markov, exactly. So there's a theorem in my head that I've never really settled down writing. I don't think, can't think of a clever use of it, but, but anyway. But that's, I think you're very right. Okay, I wanna take 10 minutes and describe some work that I'm quite excited by um, and do a little bit of theory. Uh, Chava did a lot of did theory, so I wanted to connect to Chava a little bit by doing a bit more theory. Um, and this is gonna to connect to Inverse reinforcement learning, except I'm gonna bring it one step closer to continual learning, but only a small step, by looking at this sort of, what I'm gonna call repeated inverse reinforcement learning. Okay, this is work by Nanjiang and, and Karim Amin, um, a student and a postdoc. Um, so inverse RL, um, inverse RL, I know you've heard brief bits about it. So inverse RL is, the forward problem in reinforcement learning is you're given a reward function, you produce a behavior. The inverse problem is given a, sorry, forward problem is given a reward function produce the optimal behavior. The inverse problem is given a, given a optimal behavior, an optimal behavior, infer the reward function. That's the inverse reinforcement learning problem. Beautiful, intellectually very beautiful problem defined by Andrew Wing and Stuart Russell and, and Peter Beale and Andrew Wing have done some great work with this. The bad news about 
inverse reinforcement learning, that it's fundamentally ill-defined in that it's the forward problem is many to one. Many reward functions will yield the same optimal behavior. As those of you who know have taken discrete math classes, when you invert a many to one function, you get a one to many, it's not a function, right? So you can't, it's an ill-posed problem. Okay, so for example, let me give you a, co a concrete example. Here's a grid world. You observe the behavior indexed by the, shown by the actions. Well, here are two possible reward functions, right? One possible reward function is there's a big source of reward at the bottom left corner, and, um, and the agent is trying to get there. Or there could be a reward in the two blue places, and it picks up the reward along the way to the bottom left corner. And you can imagine gazillions of such reward functions that will all lead to this kind of behavior. So it's fundamentally ill-posed. Okay, so then how does, the, how does inverse RL even get off the ground? So the way inverse RL get off the ground, and I won't spend too much time on it, is basically you can very nicely and elegantly define the space of reward functions that are consistent with that behavior. So it turns out there's a set of linear constraints defined here, and I won't spend time on this, which basically define all the reward functions for which the observed behavior is optimal in that particular environment. So that's nice. There is a space defined by a set of linear functions. So, but how do you use it then in reality? The way you use it is you add a heuristic. And you get some point in that space. And then you can use it to generate behavior. And this works. A lot of people use it. It's great. But I'm interested for today in the scientific problem of actually inferring a reward function, truly inferring a reward function. And I'm going to set it up in this lifelong learning setting as follows. So I'm going to connect it to AI safety, to lifelong learning, to continue learning in this one slide. So let's imagine now that this robot is going to act on behalf of a human over the lifetime of the human. And the human has a intrinsic reward function, which is complicated. It involves things like I don't want to harm humans, no breaking of laws, cost considerations, social norms, general preferences, all kinds of things that a human internally has as a sense of reward function. It's very hard to communicate all of that explicitly in a good reward function to the, hum to the agent. Right? The whole premise of inverse RL, it's difficult to communicate reward functions, but it's easy to show behavior, good behavior. OK, so here is the amended setting. I'm going to have this lifelong learning setting where the agent is going to experience a sequence of environments or tasks. And what I want is the agent to become better and better at doing what the human would do in those environments using inverse reinforcement learning. So I'm going to define this a new environment or task with an environment, E sub T, sort of a, think of it as a, um, a controlled Markov process, that is actions, dynamics, everything is defined. And I define a task-specific reward function, like go get me food. Now, you tell the agent to go get you food, and that's the only reward function you give, it might cook your cat. But you say, no, 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 I didn't mean you to cook, cook my cat, it's bad to cook cats, things of that sort, right? Um, so but that's the intrinsic rewards. You like your pets, you like your children, all this kind of stuff. You don't, have to want to give, you, you don't want to give all these explicit reward functions to the agent. So every task is a, is a, comes in an environment and a, and a task-specific reward function. Go, get me, go cook, get me food, clean my house, whatever, if you have a house, household robot. And so the assumption is that the human being's behavior will be with respect to the sum, and this is an arbitrary, well, not an arbitrary choice, but I'm going to assume that it's the sum of the human's behavior is going to be the sum of the task specific reward and its intrinsic and the intrinsic human reward. So the human's behavior in an environment E sub T, R sub T will be optimal with respect to R sub T plus theta star. So the agent is going to know everything except theta star. It doesn't know theta star. It'll know E sub T, it'll know R sub T. Yeah, have we not seen this notation? S is the size of the S is state space, A is action space, P sub T is a transition dynamics, transition matrices, 
R sub t is a vector of task-specific rewards for states. Theta star is the intrinsic reward for states. Gamma is a discount factor. So now, this fully defines the MDP from which the human would generate behavior. And I want the robot, or the agent, to as quickly as possible come to do behave as the human would behave. OK. So the question is, the, fund, the mathematical question is, can we learn theta star from optimal demonstrations on a few tasks? Or more importantly, and more relevantly, can we generalize to new tasks? Yes? Are you also constraining R2 to negative 1 to plus 1? So I'm going to assume the rewards are bounded. So different tasks have had really widely different I'm going to come to that in just one second. I'm going to address that exactly in one second. Um, well, it can't be one second, because one second's over, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a minute or two. Um, something I wanted to say, and I totally forgot. Uh, I'll come back. Right, the crucial thing is to generalize as quickly as possible. Hopefully, it'll come back. So now I'm going to address Joel's question. So let, let's look a little bit more carefully at the notion of unidentifiability of a reward function. There are really two types of unidentifiability. Representational unidentifiability, and what I'll call behavioral or experimental unidentifiability. One of them is uninteresting, of a sort that Joel just asked about, which, is, which should be ignored. Not Joel's question, but the idea that rewards can be uh, scaled. And the second one is more interesting, which is the environmental and, and, and should be dealt with. So let me be more precise. We define this notion of what I'll call behavioral equivalence. Two reward functions are behaviorally equivalent if there is no, un no control Markov process in which they lead to different behavior. So if I take a reward function and add a constant to it, it won't change the behavior in any environment, no matter what the dynamics of the environment are. And depending on certain other things, if I multiply by a scalar, it won't change anything. So I don't care about identifying the reward functions except to identify which behaviorally equivalent class it belongs to. So Joel, that's the answer to your question. Right? When I say identify a reward function, all I want to identify is some canonical reward function in a behaviorally equivalent class. So all reward functions that lead to the same behavior in any possible environment are in the same class. And I, and I shouldn't care about identifying one of them. Yes? I may not care about any possible environment, but I might have some subset of environments that I care about. So right, right now, so you can define behavioral equivalence with respect to a set of environments. I'm just saying any environment right now, but the notion of behavioral equivalence will, be a, will depend on the environments you care about behavioral equivalence over. That set could be a singleton. It could be a singleton. It could be a singleton. OK, so let's do two quick, yes, quick questions. No, yes, you can, right? For a subset of environments. There might be a subset of environments where there are non-trivial changes or reward functions that don't change behavior. But if you truly allow any environment, then the kinds of behavioral equivalences are, uh, um, are only trivial. Trivial in the sense of you can write down what that space contains. But if you constrain the class of environments, then you can get non-trivial classes. Good question. OK. So I'm going to do two settings. Uh, the first setting is that, and just, just for theoretical reasons, you can imagine a setting where the agent gets to present, choose the environment, choose the task, and say, here's the task. Human, tell me what you would do. That's a very powerful agent, right? Get, gets to choose the environment for the human. If you do that, it turns out you can be very efficiently learn a good approximation to theta star. Basically, you can do preference elicitation, if that makes sense to people, right? If you truly, if the agent can truly choose the environment, then the agent can choose wacky environments and really learn in parallel, and you can get this logarithmic performance and with just a quick, uh, very, very efficiently learn the optimal, optimal reward function. Yes? Uh, I thought we were talking about equivalence classes of reward functions. Yes. So how do you define this distance? Good. 
I'm assuming that uh, every reward function has been canonicalized. That is, I'm, I've picked a canonical element. So for example, what we literally do is imagine that take an arbitrary state, fix its true reward function to be zero, and scale everything accordingly. Okay. So we've picked a canonical, we, we implicitly have made a canonical assumption of reward functions. Uh, so it matters how you do that, right? Like not, for, not for this theory, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, but I'm, again, you're right. But the the it matters in the sense that um, this is the worst case result over all canonicalizations. Let's put it that way. This is a very trivial tr trivial result, and I won't I won't go through the proof because I want to get to some more interesting things. Um, then the issue is suppose you, the agent is not this powerful. Um, so w now now it's a much more interesting setting. Something else, nature, is choosing the tasks that the agent has to do. So now I'll just give you one insight and show you the main, and give the main theorem and then you're welcome to look at the paper. So now is the following insight, right? Nature is choosing tasks. Now one of two things will happen. And so the setting now is not I'm not going to learn the op, the true theta star because now nature is choosing tasks. I, it may never take me to interesting places to learn theta star. So now my measure is how often do I make a mistake? So the setting is nature gives me an E sub T, R sub T. The agent proposes a policy. The human being looks at that policy and says, yeah, very good policy. Or, no, bad policy, here's what I would have done. Every time the human being has to show a, show a demonstration, I think of that as the agent making a mistake. What I want to do is bound the number of mistakes the agent would do. Settings clear? Nature chooses tasks. Something chooses tasks. You can choose tasks adversarially. Every time a task is chosen, the agent says, this is what I'm going to do. The human being says, great, because it's what I would do or close to what I would do. Or says, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I would do this. Every time the human being says, no, 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 do this, that's a mistake. And you want to bound the number of mistakes. OK, so I'll just give you one insight and then present the main theorem and be done. Uh, the insight is. If the environments are chosen in such a way that the agent's behavior is just right behavior, for example, it's the same environment every time, then the agent will not learn more about theta star, but it's not going to make mistakes either. So every time the agent makes a mistake, the proof mechanism shows that it learns enough about the true theta star to make an improvement and make fewer mistakes later. So if the agent doesn't make a mistake, great, no mistake. If it makes a mistake, it shrinks the volume of possible rewards enough that you can get a nice result out of it. And I, I, won't, I won't spend more time on this. And basically, we have a result that looks like it's basically the ellipsoid algorithm applied to this, for those of you that's meaningful. Um, the volume shrinks, and the total, number, the total number of mistakes is order d squared log d by epsilon. Epsilon is the sort of um, how suboptimal it is when you count, before you count a mistake, and d is the dimension of the reward space. Okay, I will skip all this. Now I'm going to switch to a different topic that also connects with Nando. You can see that I've really uh, made an effort to follow up on Nando in my talk. And we talk about some work that's going to appear, ICML 2017, but we did this work a year and a half ago. Great um, thanks to the reviewers for helping make it better over iterations. Um, so I don't want to need to motivate. Zero shot learning, Nando did a great job. Rapid generalization is key to continue learning. The setting I'm going to be in is setting where tasks, the, the motivating setting is, Imagine a household robot. You, you, you go to Amazon.com, you order a robot, comes to your house. And you're going to task it to do things. It's going to learn to do things. And you're going to communicate using language, eh, very simple natural language in this setting. You're going to give it tasks, you know, fold my clothes, then, then um, make dinner, then go sit in a corner, whatever. Something like that, right? Um, and. Um, Okay. 
I'm thinking about what to say here to make it fast. Um, here's a grid world. Uh, and it has objects in it. And a task might be visit the cow, pick up the diamond, hit all the rocks, pick up all the eggs. So now it's a sequence of instructions. Each instruction has basically, at most, three things. A noun, a verb, and a count. Could be all, could be two, pick up two eggs, things of that sort. And to make the task interesting, there's sometimes random events occur, like uh, somebody, somebody uh, rings the doorbell, or in this case, some magic box appears. And when the magic box appears, you can get a nice reward by interrupting whatever it is that you're doing and, and opening that box. So that's the setting. The setting is you give them a list of instructions, the instructions of nouns, verbs, and counts, and, uh, and there's some background random thing that you have to maintain. That if, if, if some background event random ha and happens, you have to interrupt whatever you're doing and go deal with it. So that's the setting. Okay, so what are the challenges here? Well, there's a combinatorial number of tasks. So just training on all subtasks isn't really possible. So you have to generalize to unseen subtasks. You also have to generalize to unseen lists of subtasks, of tasks. You also have to decide when something is done before you can move on to the next. Right? So if you translate natural language to what the behavior should be, you also have to learn when that thing is done. And you also have to delete, deal with really delayed rewards because in our setting, we only get rewarded if the entire list of instructions is finished. So it made it harder. Right? So again, the agent is going to be given a list of instructions, it's going to do its thing. Either it does the instructions exactly correctly, gets a reward of plus one. If it doesn't, it gets a minus one or something like that. It's a really, really challenging problem. But what you want to be able to do is train it on some lists and then show they can generalize to unseen lists. OK, so we build a hierarchical architecture. It has a multitask controller and a meta controller. The multitask controller's job is takes arguments from a meta controller, sub goal arguments, and produces actions and produces an estimate if it's done or not. Is it, has it terminated or not? Has the, has the subtask it's being given finished or not? And of course, everyone gets observation. This multitask controller gets the raw observations, and the meta controller gets the raw observation, but also the list of instructions, which is shown, which is denoted here as the goal box. And the meta controller has to decide what sub goals to give. And also, remember, it has to somehow keep track of where it is, what it's doing, when it's done, move on to the next thing. It has to learn all that kind of fun stuff. So a sub goal is composed of multiple arguments, right? Nouns and verbs, things of that sort. So here is the multitask controller architecture. It's a, it's a, let me just finish this. Um, it takes observation and sub goal arguments as input, produces a primitive action and predicts whether the current state is terminal or not. It takes the sub goal arguments and basically writes weights that are a function of the sub goal arguments. And those weights that are predicted by the sub goal arguments are used to generate action and observation. So you've seen architectures like this. It's an, it's an adaptation of standard ideas into this. The other sort of thing that we had to do to make it work is we use what's called analogy making regularization, which basically says, we enforce the sub goal rep uh, argument representations so that the difference between the sub goal representation for pickup A and visit A is close to the difference between pickup B and visit B. And similarly, the difference between visit B and visit A is close to pickup B and pickup A. So we uh, injected a, a objective function, which I'm going to briefly flash up, that encourages sub goal argument representations that generalize well. Okay? I'm, I'm, the deep learning people use this all the time. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's well, not all the time, but it's an idea that we've, we've incorporated. Okay, so the multitask controller is trained first 
on simple subtasks, which using an RL objective, analogy making objective, and a termination prediction objective. So if the RL objective, these three objectives are combined, and we train the multitask controller on a subset of all possible subtasks. After we've trained the multitask controller, then we'll train the meta controller. Now on lists of subtasks. Okay, the meta controller architecture is, is slightly different. It stores the list of instructions in memory. It has a memory pointer, which it manipulates as an explicit action. But in order to do um, temporal abstraction, one of the tasks, one of the uh, things that the, multi, the meta controller does is it basically uh, has an output, explicit output, that uh, predicts whether it should update the subtask or not. And if it, and if it, um, if it uh, doesn't need to, sub if it needs to update, then it has backprop to the entire architecture. And if it doesn't need to update, then it has a simpler architecture. So I'm, I know I'm being very fast, but all the details uh, are in, a, in, in the paper. What I want to show you is basically how does it do? So here's zero shot generalization. So let's take a random agent first, as Dan, following Nando's advice. Here is the observation. So it's in Minecraft world. Here is a top-down view. The green box shows what the agent, the meta controller thinks, the pointer of the meta controller. The, the green box on top there is what sub-arguments have been given to the uh, subtask, the multitask controller. Okay, so now here, I'm going too fast. Um, so our agents play on training instructions. Let's see this one. So pick up two pig. It's, it's going to go to the pig, pick it up. Now it has transformed three cats. It'll go to the cat. It'll transform it into something else. Go find. Now a magic box appeared. The random event happened on top. Even though the pointer still says transform three cats, the task above changes to transform box. It does that. Keeping the pointer, it transforms three cats. Goes back and finishes that task. It has to find the cat first, transform three cat. Then it'll go visit a horse. And then it'll go visit sheep. OK, so that's how it does on. And then I'm going to show you generalization to longer instructions. So it'll go faster. So you can see what it's doing is maintaining. By the way, the meta controller has to take, say, something like pick up three things and internally keep track of how many it's picked up. Right? And we use recurrent architectures in the, in the meta controller in order to keep, learn how to count and, and keep track of these sort of things. So you can see the arguments being given to the multitask controller on top where the meta controller thinks it's at right now, and there's partial observability, right, because of all that, uh, because Minecraft domain with a first person view. And there you go, that's the task. Okay, and I'm gonna take questions if there are questions. Yes, Nando. Can you just like the previous slide? Previous slide. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Which slide? The meta, you want to ask about meta controller, about the multitask controller. I want to understand the, the meta controller. The higher level controller. Right, the higher level controller gets the observations, has this, writes the weights, depends on the um, current sub goal that it has already given. The, the Output of the multitask controller, whether it thinks the task is completed or not. These are the subtask arguments it's producing. It has uh, a representation of the current, go current goal, R sub t is coming out from there. Um, it has an explicit output that says, am I going to update my subtask or not? If it chooses to update, then it does backprop to this. If it chooses not to update, then it doesn't update. The connection breaks between we stick with the previous sub goal. So it learns whether to update the sub goal or not. And so we get very fast, rapid, you know, zero shot generalization to unseen tasks by training on a subset of the tasks. How am I doing for time? I have, a, I have one more thing to talk about. So this, that's the background task. The background task is when a box appears, 
It has the opportunity to earn some reward by interrupting whatever it's doing and going and touching that. The idea is to model the notion that there's something that you need to maintain. So you might be given a task of, you know, fold my clothes, it's a household robot, uh, you know, cook my dinner, but it, there's a background task to keep the baby safe. The baby is crying, you go attend the baby. No matter whenever the baby, whatever else you're doing, baby comes first, kind of thing. Uh, as an example, motivation. Yes? What, what does this look like when it fails or when it doesn't generalize? <clears throat> so there are m many ways it can fail. It can, it can move on to the next sub goal before it's finished. It can change the subtask arguments before the previous task is finished. Counting can fail. You know, it, it needs to pick up three things, but it only picks up two or it picks up four. So counting can fail. Because the meta controller has, to, has the subtask controller only, we never say to the subtask controller pick up three things. We only say pick up pig. So if they pick up three pigs, then you'll have to say pick up pig, wait for termination, pick up pig, wait for termination, pick up pig. Right, it has to do all that. So it can fail in many, you know, it can fail because it, the, 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 it moves on before things finish, things of that sort. Did, did you see that? Yes, yes. I, um, you know, this is Jun, Jun's work, and Jun is great at making things work. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a trivial thing to make it work. Yes? Right, so during training, we only see a subset of the subtasks, and we only see short lists. So in the zero shot case, we will see lists much, much longer um, than, let me, much, much longer than, we, we never trained in more than five instructions. So here you're seeing like 20 or something, right? So it, 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 it transfers to much longer sets of instructions, unseen instructions, right? So it's getting zero shot by basically learning how to, trans, how to manage the list the meta control learning how to manage the list, and by learning how to transform using analogy making regularization, an instruction to the correct subtask sub arguments. So just that put together, and how to interrupt and come back, how to interrupt and still keep maintain your pointer. So when all of that is put together nicely, then all of this zero shot generalization happens. Right. You know. It, 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 all of these pieces have to come together. Okay, I'm gonna now present work that's really hard off the press. It's not, it's under review, um, that I'm very excited about. Uh, actually, it's gonna be an archive just next week. Again, this is work by Jun uh, on value prediction networks. Um, I'm very excited by this idea. It builds quite, quite closely on the Predictron work by uh, David Silver. Um, the Predictron work was limited uh, to policy evaluation, we wanted to do optimal control, and so we took the Predictron idea and extended it to optimal control. Let me now connect, before I talk about the idea, let me connect it to the continually learning story. I guess that's the next slide. So, um, we know that observation prediction models are extremely hard to build, right? If, if I ask you to close your eyes and tell me what observation you will see, when you open your eyes, you'll have a really hard time producing a great pixel-based observation. You'll have a pretty easy time answering certain questions about the observation. How far is the wall between 20 and 30 feet? I don't know, I'm making it up, right? What's the color of the wall? If you close your eyes, you know, you'll guess some somewhat reasonable color. How many screens there are, you probably have, can answer that question. What are the exact pixels everywhere? You won't be able to tell, right? So we can't build. We know we can't build. Well, maybe we can in certain settings. But in general, we won't be able to build good observation prediction models. If planning, which we have to plan, in the end, to build AI, we have to plan, right? In some fashion. We have to look ahead in some fashion inside our head. Inside, the agent has to look ahead inside its head. In some fashion. So now, and let's call that a very general sense of planning. So if planning requires observation prediction models, we're in trouble. 
On the other hand, we know we can make all kinds of predictions at many different temporal scales, right? You heard that from Nando, you heard from other people's work. A lot of people are working on, uh, on making long-term predictions about various things. So the question is, can you plan with those predictions without, without doing observation prediction models, a more traditional sense of model building, a forward model, right? Your current situation, you predict the next observation, you update your state, and you roll that forward. That's, that's hard. So how can we plan? So that's the question. Again, heavily inspired by Silver et al.'s Predictron, uh, where we extend this to optimal control. So here's the idea. Let me do this. Actually, let me show the full slide. Um, so we have a core module that gets iterated to do planning. What's the core module? The core module takes an observation or some set of observations and produces an internal set of predictions, internal state. Not, not the sense of MDP state, but just internal neural network state. Right, encodes the input. Then that encoding, uh, along with an option, not necessarily a primitive action, but some option, predicts the reward for that option all along the way. So it's an extended behavior. The reward along the way and the effective discount. This comes from the predictron work. If you've seen the predictron work, you see something very similar. And you predict the sort of the number of steps that option will take, in effect. And also you predict the value associated with that, uh, with that internal state S. So you're predicting three things, R, gamma, and V. And then you do a transition that takes internal state option to next internal state. If you have these four pieces, the difference between the predictron work, there wasn't an action, there wasn't an option. If you have these four pieces, then you can roll it forward without ever predicting observations. You start with some observation, the current observation. You build an internal state. You say, what if I were to take option 01? It'll be actually be a tree, right? Because you can do many different options. But I'm showing you one rollout. You consider option 01, you get to a new internal state, you predict the reward, discount, and value of that state. You say, well, what if I take another option from this state? How will I transform my internal state to the internal state and make these predictions? If you can do that, then you can plan. Well, then you can at least look forward, look ahead. Yes? So just in your f-out function, you're predicting the reward and the discount cluster? Along the option. And why would you predict the discount cluster? Don't think of it as, sorry, I, I, okay, I see what you're. I'm looking at, think of it as just the effective discount. If it takes five steps, it's gamma to the five. Okay. Okay. Effectively, you're predicting how long will this option take. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Good catch, yeah, I shouldn't call it discount. I should call it sort of effective discount. E effective discount. Uh, yes? The, the, the core module is what's repeated. So you start with observations to get the first internal state, and then you don't get any more observations. This R gamma V is the prediction there, so it's sort of, I've taken the core module and made it vertical, right? That gets repeated. And so now you can do planning. If you've learned such a model, you can do planning. You can do look ahead search, right? You can say, what if I take this option? What if I take that option? What if I take that option? And you can build out a tree. And you can do UCT if you wanted to. It's sort of more clever than full look ahead search. We don't do UCT yet, but we do some kind of uh, incomplete search to plan. Because like any planning thing, you know, if you build a tree, you can only go so deep in a tree. So you want to go deep, uh, but with carefully chosen trajectories. So any kind, of, any kind of search algorithm could be adapted here to do planning. And because these steps are options, they can take multiple steps, right? So they're already, already going very deep in time. Okay, how do you learn this? Well, learning 
is, again, this diagram will look familiar if you look at the predictron work, except there are options here, right? There are actions in here. So what you do is you basically roll it out, and there are multiple parameters. How much do you roll it out? How deep do you uh, predict? Uh, and, and how do you, what planning do you do at the end to get a terminal value? Right? Because, and then you can learn by looking at things that actually happen, learning the reward and the effective discount is supervised learning, learning the value is, is, is a Q-learning, multi-step Q-learning like update, the targets of multi-step queue learning are produced by planning at the end, so you get better performance even. And there are, so there are many, many, there are not many, but there are multiple parameters here that you have to, that you, ha you can use and exploit. Yes? So if you have to get the reward signal for the B, are you doing also like consistency? Yes, we are doing consistency. We're making sure that, just like Predictron, right, we, we one step and two, you know, the multiple estimates are constrained to be, you know, you get error functions. So it's the same idea, really. It's really predictor on done with options so you can plan. So if you know what, I'm sorry, I know most of you probably don't know what the predictor on work. It's really cool work. Uh, it's, we've just taken that idea and really shown how to do planning with it. Okay, so let me, in the few minutes remaining, let me, uh, let me, um, I can go five minutes past something, yes. Let me show you some results and then I'll stop. So here's a, a, a nice domain. It's, it's basically like traveling salesman. You have to collect things. So you start, the green is the agent, the blue are the rewarding gold nuggets. The task is to go pick up as many gold nuggets as you can in a finite horizon. It's deterministic or stochastic, you can read it both. But basically you want to find the path that has a max, that pick up the most gold nuggets in the whatever time your lifetime is, okay? So here, just to show you, is a, that, you know, this is not an easy task to do, right? Um, because you have to look at the visual observation and, and figure out, a plan a path. Because if you make the wrong steps at the beginning, you already sort of, you may already have lost value. So you really have to plan the right path right from the beginning. Anyway, here's, what DQ, here's an example of a path that DQN will do if it has 20 steps. And here's a different path that VPN, which is this value prediction network, does. Uh, and you can see that, you know, this doesn't look that unreasonable, right? It comes, picks this up, picks those up, picks that up, and this took a quite different path. But it turns out this has one more gold nugget it picks up compared to the, compared to the DQN. And I will show you more. Here is the other cool thing. This, by the way, was repeated planning, right? You, 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 you take the action, uh, then you plan, uh, plan a path, Take the first action, repeated planning, right? That's how VPN and DQN will do it. Here is just looking at a full plan that can produce. So you can, once you've built this thing, you can basically, in a, in a deterministic environment anyway, which this one is, you can just say, tell me what you would do in the entire future. And you can see the VPN plan for 20 steps versus the VPN plan for 12 steps. So it's sensitive to sort of how deeply do you plan and, and you know, uh, picks up, picks pretty good paths. Um, this, again, is not, a, not an easy problem to, to solve. It looks easy. Um, we compared it against many different things. Um, we compared it against actually learning an observation prediction model. That's OPN. This is a simple enough environment that you can actually learn decent observation prediction models and plan using observation prediction models. Uh, we also did VPN. By the way, the number in parentheses is the amount of look ahead. How many steps you look at, one, three, or five. Um, and you can see the, the crucial thing to take away is VPN beats OPN, which uh, observation prediction model. But also, the deeper the look ahead, the better it does. So it, 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 um, you know, five is only slightly better than three. I'd probably tell you what the options were. The options were go straight until you get to a choice point. So go right until you get to a choice point, go up until you get to a choice point, go left. Those were those the options. Okay, we also did some Atari game work, so we tried many different Atari games. Um, and the blue curve is, is uh, VPN's performance and DQN is the DQN performance. And uh, in all games but two, I think Alien and, and uh, Pac-Man, 
uh, it, it, it led to an improvement in performance over, over, over uh, BQN. Okay, I'm gonna just do an abrupt stop. That's why I'm gonna stop, take a few minutes for questions, uh, but you have a question right there. We don't learn options, excellent question. These were hardwired options. We're learning to plan given hardwired options. We're not discovering options. That would be really cool. And we're working on it, but that's a really cool problem. Yes. yes. Doina has some work on discovering options. Yes. yes first, I, I really like that, the focusing on, on basic motivation. Thank you, Andrew, and everybody wait for that. Then I was wondering, and, uh, when, when the algorithm was looking at the internal structure of the agents, I made this question before, uh, if we allow ourselves to do that, then we can think value generation as two agents. One that gives you the reward out there, and then we are training an intrinsic. Why not, are you saying why not give the optimal value as the optimal, why isn't the optimal value function the optimal internal reward? Even more, the value generation is training a, a, a reactive agent. Even but can I answer the interesting question first? Sure. Why isn't the optimal value function the optimal internal reward? Anybody wants to help me answer that? Why isn't the optimal value function the optimal internal reward? It'd be a terrible choice of a reward. But why? Because you're double counting rewards? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to cheat. That's not the point. Sorry, that's not the question. Here's the answer. We know from reward shaping that for a single task, it's the optimal reward function. Good. So that's the, that's the start of the answer, right? Which is that if you care about a single task, of course, you can solve the task, and then you're done. Mm -hmm. The point of a reward function is to make an agent that's good at learning, good at behaving across tasks, which is what I meant when I said in the very beginning, right? The real challenge is, what is the right level to define the reward function? You know, there is the objective evolutionary reward function, procreate. But should I drink a cup of coffee right now? How does that affect it by that reward function? I don't know, right? We have much more proximal reward functions. But too proximal would be too constraining, make us very inflexible. And so to get the flexibility of behavior we have, the ability to adapt to new environments requires the sort of just the right reward function. And that's what evolution presumably did, or at least found a good one. But that wasn't your question. What is your question? So if, um, it's like I'm insisting in value duration. So if you use value duration and you get the finally the value, this is like training an agent where, for, where they can only decide what to do. It's like a, it's training a greedy policy. What I'm saying is that we, this is like, like this already happening if we allow ourselves to get into the values of the internal agent. So my question then is, what about the communication cost? Meaning, this is the, uh, the, the designer and this is the agent there. And part of the patient for, for the robustness yes. is that I don't have him feeling bad for, for telling me yes. what to do. Yes. So it's, it's like the, the, the reason for separation is related with the, with the cost yes. of communication. So I, there's a whole body of work I do that I haven't talked about, which is multi-agent problems, in which communication costs play a role. So I have a line of work. If I were to give a talk on safety in AI, I would talk about work on um, querying. How should a robot query a human being when a human being is distracted and there's a cost to communicate? It's all kinds of work that multi-agent systems people are doing that go in that direction. So yes, those are important questions. I think so that we make sure we have time, time for to eat. and we come back. It's not quite going to be safety in AI, but it's going to be safe MDP. It's going to be safe um, MDPs, yes. That is going to be a talk by Phil Thomas right after the coffee break. I think we're going to eat. Thanks, Ginger. Thank you. Thank you.